Dzień dobry, witamy Państwa po przerwie. Ja nazywam się Justyna skawiańczyk żur Agnieszka Chybę-Szymańska. Za chwilę pokrótce nakreślimy Państwu naszą ofertę. Zanim jednak to zrobię, chciałam y, kilka słów powiedzieć o, y, o rozporządzeniu MEN, które weszło w życie y, y, 30 maja 2014 roku. Jest ono o tyle istotne, że w zasadniczy sposób zmienia sposób y, uczenia języka obcego w przedszkolu. Y, to rozporządzenie, głównym jego celem jest y, wprowadzenie bezpłatnej i obowiązkowej nauki języka obcego właśnie w, w placówkach objętych kształceniem przedszkolnym. I y, Jest to możliwe dzięki, y, dzięki wprowadzeniu nowego obszaru do podstawy programowej. Ten obszar nazywa się przygotowanie dzieci do posługiwania się językiem obcym nowożytnym i treści tego obszaru można było już wprowadzić do przedszkola, jeśli dyrektor podjął taką decyzję od tego roku, od września tego roku. Od września 2015 roku obowiązkowo będzie objęty tym nauczaniem języka obcego, będą objęte dzieci pięcioletnie, a od września 2017 roku już wszystkie dzieci korzystające z edukacji wczesnoszkolnej. Pearson ma oczywiście pełną ofertę dla najmłodszych. Obok najwyższej klasy materiałów edukacyjnych oferujemy Państwu również szkolenia, materiały dodatkowe, pełny pakiet materiałów dla lektorów zarówno w wersji tradycyjnej, jak i cyfrowej oraz możliwość testowania dla Państwa najmłodszych uczniów. O egzaminach Pearson Test of English Young Learners słów kilka opowiemy za chwilę. Katalog naszych publikacji dla przedszkoli to odpowiedź na rozmaite potrzeby zarówno państwa, jak i uczniów. Dla przedszkoli, które realizują minimalną liczbę godzin, proponujemy państwu My First English Adventure oraz Ricky the Robot. Na kursy intensywne proponujemy My Little Island oraz serię Packets. Mamy dla Państwa bardzo dobrą wiadomość. Wszystkie nasze kursy przedszkolne, jak i dla zerówek, objęte zostały 30% rabatem. Rabat ten dotyczy zarówno zeszytu ćwiczeń, jak i książki ucznia. Może być on realizowany w dobrych księgarniach językowych, przez nasz e-sklep oraz przy zamówieniach zbiorowych. Oczywiście zachęcamy, żeby przekazali Państwo tą informację rodzicom, gdyż będą oni zainteresowani zakupem z rabatem. Szczegóły dotyczące naszych publikacji oraz y, szczegóły dotyczące promocji znajdą Państwo na naszej stronie internetowej pearson.pl łamane przez maluchy oraz w ulotkach informacyjnych, które dołączone są do materiałów konferencyjnych. Zerówki to ten temat, który stał się gorący właśnie dzięki temu rozporządzeniu w tym roku. Dla uczniów w wieku 5-6 lat uczęszczających do zerówek mamy dwie propozycje. Pierwszą z nich jest Our Discovery Island Starter, podręcznik, który zapewne już Państwo znają, a drugą to najniższy poziom naszego bestsellerowego kursu New English Adventure, kompletnie nowe wydanie naszej serii, które w tym roku oddajemy do Państwa dyspozycji również na poziomie właśnie zerówkowym. New English Adventure Starter to przede wszystkim znani i kochani przez dzieci bohaterowie z filmów Disneya, ale również wsparcie dla Państwa, wsparcie umożliwiające pracę z grupami zróżnicowanymi wiekowo, zróżnicowanymi nie, nie tylko pod względem wieku, ale również umiejętności i poziomu rozwoju. To jest to, z czym nauczyciele będą się mierzyć właśnie w tych mieszanych wiekowo grupach. Zróżnicowanie materiału pozwoli Państwu w sposób łatwy i przyjemny pracować z takimi dzieciakami. Różnorodne typy ćwiczeń, sporo ćwiczeń pen to paper, które pozwolą Państwu skoncentrować uwagę dzieci na tym, co chcecie im prze, przekazać. Historyjki z ukochanymi bohaterami, historyjki, które również można wykorzystać w formie DVD, popracować z czantami, z piosenkami, ale również z, z materiałami extra adventure, jeżeli nasi uczniowie są na troszeczkę wyższym poziomie. Kolejną nowością jest nasz kurs Big English, który ma aż 7 poziomów zaawansowania. Spodoba się on zarówno dzieciom młodszym, jak i dzieciom starszym, gdyż jest dostosowany do wieku dzieci. Na każdym poziomie zarówno w, 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 
zarówno dla dzieci mamy odpowiednie ilustracje, zdjęcia i kurs rośnie razem z dzieciakami, dostosowując się do ich wieku. Bogata szata graficzna to jedno, dodatkowo stawiamy na naukę przez zabawę, poprzez liczne piosenki, historyjki, a w każdym rozdziale znajdą też Państwo sekcję values, którą, w której uczymy uniwersalnych wartości. Mocnym atutem Big English jest nacisk na samoocenę i ewaluację, assessment for learning. Dzięki temu nauczyciel pozwala uczniom rozwijać samoocenę, poczucie, poczucie sukcesu. Kurs wspomaga rozwój umiejętności XXI wieku, takich jak krytyczne myślenie, praca w grupach, praca w projektach. Więcej informacji o Big English znajdą Państwo na naszej stronie internetowej. Big English to oczywiście propozycja dla dzieci ciekawych świata, a uzupełnieniem każdej naszej serii mogą być książeczki z serii Penguin, Penguin Young Readers i tutaj znajdziecie Państwo Penguin Kids opierające się na bohaterach i historiach Disneya, ale również nową serię, nową serię Penguin Kids Clear, która pozwala dzieciakom znajdować odpowiedzi na pytania o otaczający je świat. Są to że nawiązujące do różnych przedmiotów materiały, które pozwalają pracować z dziećmi również o różnym poziomie zaawansowania. Lektorom gwarantujemy wszystko to, co potrzebne do prze, przeprowadzenia angażujących zajęć. Oprócz podstawowych le zestawów lektorskich dostępne są również materiały wizualne, takie jak flashcards, karty historyjkowe, plakaty oraz nieocenione w pracy z maluszkami pacynki i maskotki. Wszystkie te materiały, może z wyjątkiem pacynek i, i maskotek, znajdą Państwo w naszej cyfrowej bibliotece e-panel. Tam e-panel cieszy się niesamowitą popularnością, więc cały czas dodajemy nowe materiały, więc nauczyciele, jeżeli Państwo chcieliby wypróbować e-panel, zachęcamy do pobrania i zainstalowania aplikacji na, na swoim komputerze poprzez naszą stronę internetową, a potem bez żadnych kodów, bez żadnych tutaj formalności zbędnych prosimy o e-mail do swojego konsultanta z tytułami, które chcieliby Państwo przejrzeć, które by, powinny być udostępnione. Wspomniałyśmy również o naszym wsparciu pozapodręcznikowym, czyli o szkoleniach. Szkoleniach takich jak dziś, kiedy spotykamy się z Państwem osobiście, ale również całej serii naszych szkoleń online. W tematyce związanej z uczeniem dzieci znajdą Państwo takie szkolenia jak między innymi dysleksja, jak classroom management, gotowe przykłady na lekcje, pomysły przeprowadzenia zajęć. To wszystko dostępne jest na naszej stronie. Każdy taki kurs kończy się quizem, który mogą państwo, do którego państwo mogą sobie podejść, zdać go i w zamian za udział w szkoleniu otrzymać imienny certyfikat. Jeżeli byliby Państwo zainteresowani formalnym potwierdzeniem swoich kwalifikacji, uzyskaniem certyfikatu międzynarodowego, jest to również możliwe z użyciem Teacher Development Interactive. Jest tam moduł poświęcony uczeniu maluchów i zakończenie takiego kursu, który robicie Państwo samodzielnie, przy komputerze, jest zakończone otrzymaniem certyfikatu Hunter College, City University of New York. Także tutaj zachęcam też do zapoznania się z tą możliwością. Um, państwa kwalifikacje to jedno, a druga rzecz to możliwość sprawdzenia e, umiejętności uczniów. Coś, co być może jest bardziej atrakcyjne dla rodziców niż, niż dla samych uczniów, czyli formalne potwierdzenie poziomu języka e, ich, ich dzieci. E, to nasze egzaminy Pearson Test of English Young Learners. Jest to egzamin na czterech poziomach, przeznaczony dla dzieci w wieku od 6 do 12 lat i co najważniejsze, przeprowadzany w formie zabawy. Podczas egzaminu dzieci biorą udział między innymi w grze językowej, dostają autentyczne scenariusze z życia codziennego i celem tego egzaminu jest potwierdzenie umiejętności wykorzystania języka w sposób komunikatywny. Co oczywiście znacząco może wpłynąć na motywację dzieciaków, państwa satysfakcję, no i przede wszystkim satysfakcję rodziców. Tak jak powiedziałam, w egzaminie dzieci poznają rodzinę Brownów, bardzo sympatyczną, nie do końca typową angielską rodzinę na wszystkich poziomach i z nimi związane różne zadania mają do rozwiązania. Więcej informacji w naszej sekcji egzaminy na stronie. 
Podsumowując, wybierając współpracę z Pearsonem, zapewniają Państwo swoim uczniom dobry start w świat języka angielskiego. Maluchy będą świetnie się bawić z wykorzystaniem naszych materiałów, bo u nas nawet testowanie ma formę zabawy, tak jak tutaj Agnieszka powiedziała. Lektorów wyposażamy w niezbędne materiały, a dzięki szkoleniom mogą Państwo nieustannie podnosić swoje kwalifikacje. Mam nadzieję, że Państwa wybór to Pearson. Zapraszamy serdecznie na sesję, którą poprowadzi dla Państwa Rob Dean. Over to Rob. Okay. Dzień dobry Państwu. Is this working? Can you hear me? You're good, you can, good, excellent. Welcome, welcome. It's great to be here today in Krakow. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here today as well. You know, the sun's shining, the sky's blue, the shops are open, and you're all here. That's fantastic. So I'll do my very best to make sure that what follows is useful, interesting, worthwhile, practical, and who knows, maybe even fun. At this point, I'd also like to say a big hello to all the people who are watching us out there in cyberspace. Uh, we're being streamed live on the internet all over the world. Well, at least somewhere near Krakow, I'm sure. We'll see. So this session, then, is, uh, is about teaching primary. In fact, pre-primary, very little ones. Um, some practical ideas, some thoughts, some uh, considerations, and also a look at some of the materials that we have available to help with this process. But like with any good lesson, we're going to begin with a little warm-up activity. Now, I know it's already warm in here, but I'm talking about a linguistic warm-up, okay? Um, for this, I'm going to um, make some statements, and I'd like you to respond to the statements. So if what I say is true for you, I would like you to clap three times. Okay. If what I say is false, okay, not true for you, I'd like you to stamp three times. Okay, so just a reminder, if it's true for you, clap. If it's false for you, stamp. Let's make some noise. Are you ready? Okay, um, first of all, you had an excellent summer holiday. So did I. I can't clap with my hands full though. All right, you are very, very, very happy to be back at school. Now that's interesting. Yesterday we had a little bit more stamping and less clapping. Today in Krakow, very positive. I love it, I love it. Okay, um, you teach Zerówka. Okay, a bit of a mixture there, all right. Um, you have taught English for five years or more. That's a lot of experience, isn't it, if we add it all together. Um, you have taught English for two years or less. Don't be shy. All right, so it seems everybody has at least two years' experience. That's absolutely wonderful. So there we go. A little warm-up activity uh, based on the principles of TPR, total physical response, indeed, yes. Um, and something you might think about using in class if you don't already. Obviously, change the instructions. So, for example, you like pizza, and the children clap. You like, oh, yeah, you can do it if you like. You like spinach. And I bet most of the kids will stamp, won't they? So we can simplify it and adapt it. And that's the first of many, many activities I'd like to share with you in this first session today. Um, you'll have noticed the title included this word, sparkle. Now, I think this word is a very important word in any learning teaching environment, not just with little children. I went to the dictionary, though, to find out what it means. And as you can see on the screen, I've hidden some of the words from the definition. So what we're going to do is see if we can guess what these hidden words are. We'll have two teams to do this. At this side of the room, we'll have team one, OK? And over at this side of the room, we'll have team, no, team A. You're both the best. Now, there's a serious point here. Many years ago, I was teaching in Spain, and uh, I did the usual team one, team two, and this little kid came to me and he said, I don't want to be in team two. Team two's not as good as team one. 
He said it in Spanish, but I understood what he meant. So I often use team names, let them choose colours or animals or film stars. Today it's one and a. All right then, so let's see what we can do. So team one, can you guess what word number one is, beginning with Q? Well done, exactly. Quality is the first word. You have a point. Superb. Okay, team A, number two. Is it something? Are you sure? It was someone, but never mind. You've still got a point. I'm being generous. Okay, what do you think for number three? Something. Very good. Okay, number four. Interesting. Well done. And everybody, number five? Life. Or did somebody say love? That's all right. It's positive, isn't it? It's all about positivity. So there we go. That is what I think is important in any learning teaching environment. Something that's interesting and full of life. And what I'd like to do in the session today is share with you, basically, my recipe for sparkle. The ingredients that I think we need to put into the classroom to make sure this happens. And along the way, although not necessarily in this order, we'll be considering what four to six year olds are like in, in terms of how they differ from maybe older age groups, um, how they learn and also how they don't learn, what this means in the classroom. And as I said earlier, lots of approaches, lots of materials and lots of activities. So I hope you're feeling energetic. There'll be lots for you to do in this session. All right. Um, this picture is a clue as to the first ingredient for my recipe. What do you think this picture represents? Any ideas? Okay, so we can see lots of characters talking, all right? So let's guide you along the way here. Lots of characters talking. What do you think they're talking about? Everything. Things they are interested in or things they are not interested in? Exactly. Things they're interested in, and what this represents in my recipe is the first important ingredient, the right topics. Have a look at these pictures. Here are six pictures taken from a variety of course books for very young learners. Let's see if we can work out what each picture represents in terms of the topic. So the first one, top left, is food. Very important one, that. Middle, what do you think the middle is? Yes, school. It's interesting, isn't it? You ask a lot of kids from the age of five to 18, do you like school? And very often the answer is no. Well, sometimes they say yes. A lot of them will say no. Um, it's all down to the fact that even at young ages, it's not very cool to say you like school. So they won't admit it, but school's a massive part of their lives and an important part of what we can discuss, talk about, and use as a context in class. All right, what about the next one, top right? Holidays, I'm sorry to mention that. It's a bad time to talk about holidays now, isn't it? Just finished. Okay, bottom left. Family, very good. Bottom middle. Toys. And bottom right. Yeah, house and home, exactly. All right, so I don't think it takes an awful lot of thinking about to realize that all of those topics represent the world of children things they're interested in, things they will respond to if we use them in class. There are quite a number of other topics that are missing. What else could we add to this, do you think? Body, animals, any more? Colours, numbers, friends, that's a good one, isn't it? Technology, perhaps. We haven't mentioned technology. You know, even youngsters are fascinated by technology. My little nephew told me recently that my new Nokia phone is rubbish. <laughs> He's only six years old, and he seems to think that this is rubbish. He says, I should have got an iPhone. So there you go, technology. Here's another picture, okay, another picture. You can uh, realize from what you said earlier on that this represents the topic, of course, of animals, but not just any animals. Where do you think this picture comes from? Which movie? Exactly, yeah. Have you seen the movie? Yes, indeed. And this picture actually features, and the, the topic and the characters feature in uh, English Adventure Starter, the new English Adventure. 
All right, so topics that are friendly to kids. Language is clearly related to topic. We use language to talk about our feelings around certain subjects, to find things out around certain subjects, to share information around those subjects. Context then must be linked to what children are interested in, to their experiences, to their interests, if they're going to be in any way meaningful. And this is another important thing. Starting with the known, so things that kids can already identify with, makes it easy to move into the new. So putting things like Disney characters into New English Adventure isn't there just as a gimmick. It really is based upon the fact that the kids will have met these characters in their own world, in Polish. Meeting them in the English environment makes life exciting, interesting and easier to develop into new areas. So that was ingredient number one, the right topics. This represents ingredient number two. Now don't take it too literally, the ingredient isn't M&Ms. It represents something else though, what do you think? Colours, okay, yeah. Senses, you're on the right lines here. Okay, all the same or all different? There's lots of differences, aren't there? So when we have differences, we have variety, exactly. That's the word I was looking for, variety. Another important thing to keep in our classrooms. Four to six-year-olds, as we know, have an incredibly short attention span. Would you agree? Yeah, it's said, in fact, that one's attention span in minutes is the same as one's age in years. So a six-year-old can concentrate for six minutes. Sounds about right to me. So when you reach the age of 25, <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> when you reach the age of 25, you can concentrate for 25 minutes or even more. So attention span is a major thing. Too many similar activities are going to result in boredom, a lack of engagement, and of course, once you have that, you have discipline trouble. We also need variety to address different learning preferences, particularly sensory channels. We often talk about these three, the visual, the auditory, what's the third one? The kinesthetic, when we talk about teaching children. And it's true to say that I think we all take in information through all three channels. With children, the kinesthetic channel is perhaps that little bit more pronounced. So I'm going to be looking in the next little section at some very practical ways in, in which we can um, harness all of the senses, but also provide for the kinesthetic too. All right, I'm going to do this via a set of flashcards. We started with animals earlier on with 101 Dalmatians. I've brought some flashcards here from New English, uh, sorry, from My Little Island. Uh, these are all representing different pets. I think they're all clear, aren't they? Can we just double check? Top left is... Let's be simple. We'll call it a bird today. It might be a parrot or a, some exotic African bird, but today it's bird. All right, easy. Um, that's easy. What about this one? Is it a tortoise or a turtle? Does it live in water? All right, then, it's a turtle. No, it's a tortoise. Hang on, I'm confused now. Okay, today it's a tortoise. It doesn't live in water, all right? And I think the others are clear. And we'll call this just fish, okay? It might be a goldfish, but it's fish today. All right, first activity. This does involve some movement, so I would like you, please, to stand for this. Can you stand up? Oh, I can hear you groaning. We don't want to stand up. We want to sit still. All right, then. I'm going to say some words, okay? and point to the pictures. If I say the word wrongly, I would like you to turn round and face that way. Okay, so you turn round and face that way. If I say the word correctly, I'd like you to turn around and face the windows. Okay, let's just quickly practice. Okay, so correct. You have to be faster than that. We're gonna do this really quickly, okay. Wrong. Much better. Okay, right. Face the front. Are you ready? Okay. I'll say the number and the word. So you respond. All right. Are you ready? Two, cat. Very good. Face front. Three, tortoise. One, cat. Five, goldfish. <laughs> Four, mouse. Two cat. 
one bird, three tortoise, two cat, two bird, one bird, two tortoise, three cat, four mouse. Very good. Okay, that's fine. I sit down again. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> A bit like the first activity. Even though the kids aren't producing language at this stage, they're still having to respond and process information in the mind in order to respond in the right way. Um, if you have more space in the classroom, which clearly we don't have space in this room, you could actually get the kids to step to the side and actually move from side to side instead of spin around on the spot. But I'm sure you can think of your own uh, different adaptations of all of these. Step to the side being the first one. And here's another one, much quieter. And for this, I'd like you to close your eyes. Could you do that for me? I'm not going to do anything bad, I promise. <laughs> or am I? All right, eyes closed, no peeping. Okay, right. Could you open your eyes, please? Tell me which one is missing. It is indeed. Well done. Fantastic. So good, we'll do it again. Ready for the next one? Eyes closed. And eyes open. Which one's missing? It is the dog indeed. Well done. Right, let's make this more challenging. One last time. Eyes closed. And eyes open. Uh, exactly. Fantastic. Well done. Um, you don't necessarily need all this technology to do this. Um, very easy way of doing it is simply to have the flashcards and attach them to the board, um, get the kids to close their eyes and remove them. Another nice thing you can do here actually is reward good behaviour by letting the kids come to the front and actually manipulate the cards, take them down and stick them back again. Have you noticed how little children are fascinated by the board? Have you seen this? I mean, nowadays, some schools have interactive whiteboards, and that's even more exciting. But in my day, a piece of chalk and the blackboard was just heaven. It was wow. And now I think that still exists, getting the kids to the front. They do enjoy doing anything involving the board. OK, here's another one. Here's another one. Um, hidden behind the blue square is one of those animal cards. And we're going to guess this time. Um, stick with our teams, so team one and team A. Um, let's let Team A begin. What do you think, Team A? What do you think it could be? It's not fish, I'm afraid. No, I'm sorry. Team 1. It's not dog. It is cat. Well done. Excellent. Superb. You have a point. Okay. Right, Team 1. What do you think the next one is? It's not dog, I'm sorry. Again, sorry? It's goldfish, well done. Superb, you have two points. Come on, can you get a point? You must, you must. All right, one last one. What do you think? Uh, the first one I heard was, in fact, mouse. You've got a point, well done. So, again, a little activity you can do using the cards. Uh, the way I normally do that is just hold the cards in my hand, and whichever one is on the top is the one the kids have to guess. It's a game involving competition. It's a game involving teamwork rather than individuals here. You can modify that slightly, though, if you want to manage the activity a little bit more carefully by getting the children to raise their hands if they want to answer. Sometimes they can all shout at once. And the other problem, of course, sometimes is that the quieter ones or the slower ones don't have time to join in because the quicker ones have already shouted out. So, again, with all of these, think about how you might adapt them for your own situation. One last one before we move on. Um, very simple activity this time. You can see the numbered cards again. I'm going to say the numbers. Can you say the words? That's all there is to it. Okay. Right. Two. Bit louder. We can't hear you. Two. Thank you. Six. Five. Four. One. Two. Three. One. Five. Six, three, one, six, four. Let's vary it now slightly. I don't know which one will disappear next. What do you think? What does this side, go on, what do you think? Tortoise? Okay, what do you think? Is it going to be the tortoise or the cat? Or could it be the mouse? It's the tortoise. Well done, okay. Let's keep going. Three. Five, one, four, 
Right, now then, it's either cat, so raise your hands if you think it's going to be cat. Okay, raise your hand if you're going to guess and think it's mouse. Mouse wins, but does it? Yes, it does. Fantastic. Okay, right, let's see if you can do this. This is the ultimate challenge. Here we go. One, two, three, four, six. Ah, uh -uh. you got to listen. Five. Fantastic. For obvious reasons, a disappearing drill. And again, with this, you might, with very little kids, not use the numbers. You might want to just focus purely on the animals, have the cards on the board, and point to them, and then remove them gradually as you go along. So, um, four little activities, and I showed you those for a good reason. Um, there's a clear link here with managing groups of little kids in the way that you operate with different activities in class. So those were the four that we had. In terms of variety, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, I won't analyze them all in detail, but I think we can already see there's quite a lot of different sensory channels going on there. There's also something else going on. We've got different energy levels. So a step to the side or turning around like this gets very, very energetic. The kids can get quite excited. They might even get a bit out of control. It's a stirring activity. Think about stirring a cake, everything moving around. That's what we call a high energy activity. But if we have a lesson that's all high energy activities, we're going to end up with absolute chaos, aren't we? So we need to settle them down from time to time, which is where closing the eyes and using the memory came in with the second one. So a settling activity. But by the same token, we can't have an entire lesson full of settling activities, can we? Because sooner or later, the kids will get excited and want to move. And if we don't give them a constructive opportunity to do so, they will move in a disruptive way. So, again, a stirring activity, shouting out what the card could be. And then again, any activity involving memory tends to be a settler. So the disappearing drill. Talking of memory, can you remember what number one was? Yeah, it works, doesn't it? And I bet at the end of this session, the top left of the screen will still bring to mind the bird for some reason. So there we go. The next ingredient is closely related to what we've been talking about, actually. Um, there's the uh, clue, the picture clue. What do you think this represents? Again, somebody said it. Fun is, yes, absolutely, and beginning with M. Movement, thank you. Yes, sorry, I couldn't hear you properly. Movement. Now, we talked a little bit about movement in the last section when we're talking about the visual, the auditory, and the kinesthetic. I'd like to go into a little bit more detail on this one here. Movement is vital, involving the child on all levels, not just the visual, not just the auditory, but the kinesthetic as well, means there's more chance that the children will remember it. Written activities are not possible at this age, are they? Kids cannot read or write yet. Reading and writing, am I right, only comes in halfway through grade one? Is that right? I've done my homework, you see. All right, so four to six-year-olds are not reading, they're not writing. We need other ways to make language memorable. So if we can get the kids to experience it through all these channels, there's a far stronger chance of it being retained. Now, kinesthetic often brings to mind jumping up and down and running around and clapping and stamping. Some of these things we've already done in this session today, but it doesn't have to be that way. Kinesthetic activities can be quite subtle involving movement. In fact, some of us in this room right now are engaged in some kinesthetic activities, even though you're sitting down. How many people here at the moment are writing something? There we are. Writing is a kinesthetic trait. It's movement to help you remember something, and of course, there's a product at the end of it. How many people here, be honest, how many people here are doodling at the moment, drawing little pictures on their paper? Come on, I don't mind, it's okay. I'm not gonna be angry, yeah, a few of you are. And again, this is something that helps people to learn. They move, they have to do something to keep their, uh, themselves active in order to cement information. So some of this more subtle movement is encapsulated in the course material. So if we look at this one, listen and circle, drawing a circle, it's a universal expression. It's not linguistically bound, but it's a very effective way of the children showing comprehension and at the same time moving. How about this one? 
cutting things out and playing games. The back of most of the books nowadays, you will see, it contain resources in the student book for them to cut out and make, for example, memory game cards themselves. Here's another one. This is actually uh, a really excellent movement activity, but it's also a settling activity. Colouring. Colouring. Something that kids like doing anyway. And they do it in two very different ways, don't they? Have you noticed this? Little girls and little boys colour in two entirely separate manners. Have you noticed? Little girls, perfect. The cat's whiskers must not go any further than they should. Everything must be perfect. Little boys, finished. It's true, it's true. And I'm saying that as a man, it's terrible. I'm letting the side down. But there is truth in it. And I think the result of that is in class to make sure that we do have extra resources. This is where extra adventure that uh, Agnieszka mentioned earlier on can come in really useful. Additional resources to keep the kids busy. Um, tracing lines, another highly kinesthetic activity. And this is perhaps my favourite one. In the back of most books nowadays, you've got stickers. They're not just there as a gimmick. They have a twofold purpose here. One is to get children to move to show, um, to practice language, to show they understand the meaning. The other actually serves a good purpose in developing motor skills and coordination. In fact, for many adults, putting a sticker very neatly in the right place is quite difficult, isn't it? I struggle with it. Kids certainly do. In fact, little kids can struggle with getting a pencil out of their bag, can't they? How long does it take? You ask a class of five-year-olds, right, get your pencil. It can take five minutes by the time they've spilled everything on the floor, broken the pencil, got the wrong one, and then had a fight. So, um, all about practicing language and coordination. All right, here's the next ingredient. Any idea what this might be? Well, we can see it's the globe, but what does it represent? Yeah, well, globalism is connected, actually. It is connected. What we're actually talking about here is cross-cultural, the idea of cross-curricular, sorry, cross-curricular learning, learning about the world around us at the same time as learning English. This is often referred to as CLIL. You've heard this expression, haven't you? It's a relatively new, relatively modern buzzword, is CLIL. It's very fashionable. Certain forms of CLIL have been around for a very, very long time. In fact, anybody who's been teaching for, well, less than 20 years will have been doing CLIL anyway, because most books contain information about the world around us as well as language. The stronger form of CLIL is something slightly different, where, for example, um, certain um, disciplines are taught in the target language. So, for example, English language to teach maths. But that's slightly different from a lot, lot of what we do. So CLIL it is. Um, why? Well, it's about uh, linking topic to language. We talked about the importance of this earlier on and helping children to learn about the world around them. So integrating different aspects of geography, maths, art and so on and so on into our teaching can be a really positive thing. You've heard the expression, it sounds very violent, to kill two birds with one stone. It's a bit like that. So how can we do that? In practical terms, from very low levels, we're here getting the children to think about healthy eating, things that are good for us, things that are bad for us. And the activity at the end there is stickers. It's a great one. Here's another one, um, behavior, things you should do, things you shouldn't do. And the context here is the park. I've got another activity here. I've taken it from the pages of one of the courses where in this case we've got lots of food items. I hope this doesn't make you feel too hungry. I've numbered them as you can see and this activity admittedly is not good for Zerufka. Okay, don't try it with Zerufka. Okay, it's better at slightly older ages but I did want to share it with you because I think it's fun. This is the Krakow premiere of food arithmetic. How's your maths? Is it good? Mine is terrible. That's why I'm an English teacher. 
All right, I'm going to ask you some questions, see if you can give me the answers, all right? So, um, what is orange juice plus tomatoes? No. It's chicken. There we are, exactly, all right. Right, let's do another one. What's chicken plus pears minus cheese? Apples. I think you're probably right. Okay, good. Okay, what's uh, bread minus apples plus cheese? You're very good at this. Should we do the advanced level? That was the basic level. Let's do the advanced. Okay, here's the advanced. Here it comes right. <laughs> All right, then. Here we go. What is cheese multiplied by orange juice? Orange, very good. Okay, what is bread minus pears divided by cheese? Orange juice. You get it, don't you? It's fun. We're doing two things at the same time. For slightly older age groups at primary, I had to share this with you because I think it's so good. And the other thing is the teacher doesn't have to do all the work. The kids can quiz each other in pairs. And for any lexical set like this, all the ch children need to do is add numbers if they're not already there with a pencil on the page. And they can do this activity. Um, there's something quite surreal about it, isn't there? But we are actually doing a proper example of CLIL with that. Here's the next. Here's the next one. I think this is uh, perhaps more straightforward a clue than some of the others. What do you think this represents? I thought it was easier. Maybe it isn't. What's she doing, the teacher? She's telling a story, exactly. Stories. Stories. The primary classroom without stories is a bit like tea without milk, if you're British. Tea without lemon if you're Polish, all right? Stories. Um, question for you. How many people here have children of their own and they read stories to their kids at home? All right, that's quite a few of you. How many of us here, when we were kids, had stories read to us by our parents? That's nearly everybody. And you know, there's an interesting connection here. Many people say that those who engage with stories as children become very good linguists. I think that proves the point. So stories. Um, what I've got to share with you now are a few ideas based around stories. But first of all, why stories? Well, first of all, it's a natural opportunity for children to copy language in context. Kids are good at copying, aren't they? Do you notice this? Do they copy you? Oh, yes, they copy me as well. I sometimes stop an activity by clapping my hands and saying, thank you. And then I hear this echo. Thank you. So yes, they do like to copy. They copy things they hear from television, from the internet, from songs. Have you noticed this? There was one kid I remember who constantly used to uh, shout the same complaint if I didn't choose him to answer something. He used to say, this means war. <laughs> and he got that straight from Cartoon Network. It was not that he knew exactly what... <laughs> He didn't necessarily know the grammar of that, of course he didn't, but he knew how to use it in the right context. Which leads us on to the next thing. Kids can't analyse language at this age. They simply can't. They can't analyse their own language. They're still just developing the basics in Polish. Um, then we introduce English to them, and if we try to start with things like this is the subject, this is the object, this is the main verb, this is the auxiliary verb, the future perfect continuous and the passive is a very... I don't understand that, so how would a six-year-old? So it's about copying at this stage. Language learned and practiced in a story is something they will remember. And again, we've just established there's a comfort factor with stories. They're used to stories in their own language at home for fun with the parents. So bringing that form into the classroom is mixing the known with the new. I've got a few ideas, as I say. Um, not for any small reason is this called a big book you can see um, Ricky the robot this is the big book and there's a series of these the story books this is difficult with a microphone um, lots of lovely pictures inside and you'll also see lots of writing inside now we've just said that kids cannot read 
So what's the writing all about? Well, teachers can read, can't they? That's something to bear in mind. So let's have a look at one of the stories. Um, the first thing I tend to do with a group of little children to get them interested, to get them excited, is to do a little bit of context building, and often in the kids' own language. I don't think there's any harm in having times in class when Polish is the way to go, as long as the product of what we're doing is eventually in English. So we might set the scene, talk about where they are, talk about who they are. So we've got Toby, we've got Ricky, he's a robot. Um, we've got the mouse, we've got the dog, um, they're in the park, and we could do this all in Polish. The next thing to think about is what is the aim of using stories? Well, it's multiple, multiple aims. Really, we're talking about practicing receptive skills, but ultimately giving the kids the opportunity to produce language, to copy, to use the words from the story in their own little words. So, how can we do this? Well, begin with lots of productive stuff. Lots of productive stuff. Sorry, I said that wrong. Lots of receptive stuff, I meant. Apologies. Lots of receptive stuff. Um, resources at our disposal are the little characters themselves. This is Ricky, okay? He's the robot. Um, one of the key things in this story is the theme of a chase. So we might demonstrate, using Ricky, the action of chasing something. So the kids get familiar with it in their own language. We can then feed it in in English. There are, in the little bit of the story we're going to look at, there are three main characters. There's Ricky, there's the bird, and there is the mouse. So what I'm going to do with you, I'm going to actually divide you up into three teams. So can the first half of the room, in fact, let's have the first three rows, first three rows. Can you take the role of Ricky? Okay. Um, the back at this side, can you take the role of the bird? And over in the back corner there, including the cameraman, please. Can you take the role of the mouse? All right. Now, what we would do at this stage is actually get the kids to listen to the story and respond when they hear their character. So remember, receptive skills, though they respond. Um, I'm actually going to skip that stage because we've already done some TPR kind of work on responding to pictures. What I'm going to do, though, is play the audio track that comes with the course, and I would like you to say your parts that are in blue. Now, remember that the kids will be listening and repeating, listening and repeating, not reading. You know what? That fire engine is the most famous fire engine in Poland right now. Right, it's gone. Good. Okay, so remember, your part, when you see it in blue, I'd like you nice and loud. And let's see who is the loudest, okay? Let's see who's the loudest. Here we go. Are we ready? Ricky, Toby, Can we have some and more volume? Kim are at the park. Look at the mouse, Ricky, okay. says Ricky, Toby. Get ready. One, two, three. Hello, mouse, says Ricky. Squeak, squeak, says the mouse. Squeak, squeak says Ricky. Very good, very good. Good start. Okay, let's do the next one. Okay. A bird is chasing the mouse. Look at the bird, Ricky, says Kim. Okay. One, two. Hello, three. bird, says Ricky. Tweet, tweet, says the bird. Tweet, tweet, says Ricky. Fantastic. Okay, so I'll stop it at that stage. The story basically develops uh, where the bird chases the mouse and then the cat chases the bird chasing the mouse and then the dog chases the cat chasing the bird chasing the mouse. And there's a good reason for this. Repetition. Repetition is a good thing. Exposure to language on a repeated basis helps the kids to remember it. So by the time they've had this story several times, 
doing various different activities with it, they will have probably become familiar with the sound that birds, mice and dogs make in English. By the way, what do dogs say in Polish? Okay, so if an English dog meets a Polish dog, will it understand it? <laughs> there is a website, you'll have to find it, I can't remember what it's called, Google it. It's got all the animal sounds from around the world in different languages. It's brilliant. Do you know, Finnish dogs say vov, vov. <laughs> and they're just up the road across the sea. Um, anyway, the other point I was going to say is there's other language coming out here. Little expressions, come back, um, hello, look at the dog. So these kids are in a, way, in, a, in a position to notice and start to produce, to copy these words and expressions. Another little activity we can do with a story is to revise what's gone before. Um, this time, don't worry, I'm not going to get you to stand up or move around. We'll do that with the next activity. All right. I'm going to say some simple statements about the picture that you'll see in a minute. If I say a correct statement, I'd like you to say... Very good. If I say an incorrect statement... Brilliant. Okay, then. So here we go. Back to the pictures. Okay. The dog is purple. Okay. Ricky is silver and blue. Very good. Uh, the children are happy. The cat is chasing the dog. And so on. You could adapt that into TPR and get the kids standing up and sitting down or moving should you wish to in that situation. So a few ways of using a story. Just a few little tips though. Um, I think uh, one important thing to bear in mind here is involvement, inclusion of all the group. So group work and teamwork, when you're working with a story, I think are the way to go. And avoiding individuals performing alone. Some kids love performing alone, don't they? Some really want to stand up and sing or tell the story at the front of the room. But there's a problem with that when you have a class full of kids, the ones who are sitting down, what do they do? They very quickly get bored, very quickly might take out a piece of paper, start throwing it at the friends. If they've got phones, out come the phones. So really, I think keeping everyone involved, as we did with those team type activities. Um, as I said earlier on, balancing the receptive with the productive, lots of receptive work first, and don't expect much. Oh, I think we can expect quite a lot. Miracles. I think at this stage, at this stage, children will make mistakes. They'll get it wrong. Um, you get them to, to, to talk along, to repeat the story. There'll be all sorts of pronunciation mistakes. Let's not expect too much. Which leads us, I think, very clearly into the penultimate part of my recipe, which is this. Any idea what this represents? Um, sports could be, but I hadn't thought of sports. Teamwork, I think we've touched on teamwork actually. How are they feeling? Happy. Happy kids, that's what I'm looking at next. Happy kids. Enjoyment. I firmly believe that the idea behind getting kids proficient in English begins at the lowest levels with getting them to like English. Let's not worry if they make lots of mistakes, as I've just said. If we close the door and insist on too much accuracy, if we become too firm and too strict with them at the beginning in terms of what we expect, then they're going to hate English. So let's get them loving it. And in fact, some of you may have seen this before, in the words of a former colleague of mine, children learning English, this should all be about fun and stimulation and learning to like English rather than the immediate acquisition of highly competent skills. All right, we're nearly there, nearly time for the next break. The uh, activities and ideas you've seen all came from these. Um, you, you saw these mentioned in the introduction from uh, Agnieszka. Um, the teacher's books contain a myriad of additional activities and ideas. And to be honest, as I say, I've been using all of these. I've shown you with my own students, but I'm pleased to say the majority are in the teacher's books. But there is something missing. What do you think is missing? What haven't we done that we should do in a kid's classroom? Yeah, are you in good voice? Are you?
I hope so, I hope so, because songs are another vital part of the learning process for children. Songs and music, it's an international language. It engages the emotion. Language learned through music is memorable. And again, it's something that children like to do on their own at home in everyday life. So let's bring it into the classroom. A final animal themed song for today then. The uh, initial task with this is for the kids to listen to the song and find which animal in the picture is not mentioned. We'll skip that stage and I will tell you in fact that the bear, the poor bear, does not get a mention in the song. The others do though and these are the actions that these other animals carry out and that's exactly what we're going to do. So for the last time could you stand? Could you stand? Okie dokie. Right, can you show me climb? Show me climb. That's fantastic. Very good. Yes, lots of climbing of trees. Okay. Can you show me swim? Good. Why is it when everybody swims, they always do the breaststroke? <laughs> it's interesting that, isn't it? People don't do this one. Yeah. All right. Um, run. Come on, let's have some running. Running on the spot. Okay, that's fine. And finally, fly. Okay, there's not much room for flying, is there? It's interesting, we've got some Boeing 737s and we've got some albatrosses in the room. So this is a nice thing you can do with the kids, get them to choose what action they want to do as long as it illustrates what it is that we're focusing on. So we have our activities, let's just practice them one last time. Swim, fly, climb, run, climb, swim, Rob says swim. <laughs> this is something else you can do with these. Do you know Simon Says? The kids once said to me, who's Simon? <laughs> I said, I have no idea who Simon is. Oh, we've got Simon over there. Okay, welcome. All right, so when, they said, when I said I didn't know who Simon was, I said, okay, well, what should we do? And they said, let's do Rob Says. So Rob Says, you know the game, don't you? So Rob Says Swim. So you all swim. Okay, Rob Says Run. Run. Okay, so when there's no Rob Says, you don't do anything, okay? Uh, Rob Says Climb. Fly. Uh, uh Rob says fly. Very good. You've got the hang of that. No problem. Let's have the song. Let's have the song. Now remember, ye, the kids won't be able to read the words. The kids will learn the song by listening and repeating. Listening and repeating. Um, I've made this interactive. So we've got the blue lines for team one. We've got the red lines for team two. And at the very end, if you can see where it says, I can't fly, that's for everybody. Sorry, I got it wrong. You are Team A. How dare I? Thank you very much. Team 1, Team A. I'm forgetting my own rules, aren't I? Shocking, shocking. All right, I'll play you the first verse just so you get the tune, and then we'll sing it interactively and do the actions. So here's the tune. I promise. <laughs> That gave you the melody. It's very easy, all right? So this time for real, let's have the actions and your lines, and let's see who is the loudest. Team one or team... Thank you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Are you ready? I can't fly! Well done, give yourselves a round of applause. You were good.
Okay, would you like to sit down just for one more minute and then it's coffee time. Just to summarise then, I've tried very hard in the last hour to put some sparkle into the pre-primary classroom. We started off with a recipe that included the right topics. What came next? Variety, indeed it did, yes. What was after variety? Movement, very good, movement. And then? Cross-cultural, or CLIL, well done. And then we had after that? Stories. Stories, two more to go. Enjoyment, happy kids, I've called that part. And finally, songs. Now, who's good at word searches? On the screen is a puzzle. Can you see a word on there? There it is. And let me tell you, it took me half an hour to make that. <laughs> Not a good suggestion, really, when it comes to lesson planning time, is it? So make sure that your activity lasts longer than the time spent planning it. But on that happy note, I hope we have achieved sparkle in this session today. Uh, thanks so much for joining in with everything, for being so enthusiastic. I think you've earned a break. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Zapraszamy teraz na przerwę kawową. Można będzie też otrzymać certyfikaty za tą sesję. Przypominamy o ankiecie.